Hello and welcome to the DFCC Know and Grow segment where we are meeting the legends of yesteryear from uh, Sri Lankan rugby and we have with us a gentleman who is probably the best number 8 that Sri Lanka have ever produced. Uh, Sri Lanka captain, played for Kandy, played for CRNFC, played for CHNFC as well, an old boy of St. Anthony's College in uh, Kandy and we are very happy to have with us the current CEO of the Sri Lanka Rugby Football Union, Mr. Priyantha Ekanayaka. Welcome to the segment, uh, Priyantha. Great to have you on board. Um, let's start at the beginning. St. Anthony's, uh, they've got a history now of producing some good number eights as well. Imran Bistamin, probably the other really great number eight to come out of there. Unfortunately, career cut short. But tell us about your school career a little bit. Uh, I was very fortunate that my brother played before me mm -hmm. and uh, he played like lots of sports. Like he played for, for the cricket team, then rugby basketball and athletics so I also started playing all four sports and did fairly well at the junior level actually I captain all four sports uh, I'm just saying not about not to say about myself but we had the opportunity mm. to do that at that time but with uh, the current setup I mean most people are struggling to do two sports and uh, so that's how I started then I continued with basketball I played uh, I toured with the youth team when I was in school then mm. soon after that I played in the Asian games so my first love was basketball okay and uh, then i also played i mean cricket i was i i knew that i would like you know not go that far after first love and and then rugby another sport that i thought i would have an opportunity to play for a club so my only you know hope was or ambition was to play for candy sports club at that time okay and candy was getting beaten by 50 60 points by every side so i set a very low standard in that sense so that's how, you know, and I was very fortunate, I mean, like my brother, like I said earlier, because of my brother was there and I was in the hostel. Mm -hmm. So we had that hostel culture where everybody did sports. So, yeah. so that helped actually. That's how I got into the rugby in the first place. I remember your brother uh, from way back in the day, LV and I, a big prop forward, scary man with a beard. Uh, he was also very big. Uh, do you guys have the big gene in your family? Not really. I mean, looking at my, my mother's side, yes, we have few big, you know, uncles. But uh, from my father's side, we don't have very big people. But uh, I think I have got it from the, my your mother's side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, uh, it's really an attribute because I remember watching you. My, the first rugby game I ever watched, uh, Priyanta, was uh, with you, I think, playing for CRNFC against Petersons at Pedris Park. I still remember this uh, very, very well. And my mom saying, look at that guy, he's at the bottom of every ruck. And that was how she spotted a good player. And uh, that was when actually my introduction to rugby when you were playing at uh, CRNFC. But you played for CH before that and you played for Candy after that. Tell us about your uh, club career, Priyanka, uh, what were the most? Soon after, soon after I left school, I mean, it'll, it'll be my brother was captaining Candy. Mm -hmm. So first choice obviously was Candy and then when I started playing for Candy, I mean, then I felt like, you know, I could go a bit further, you know, I, I never, I, I dreamt of things like, you know, but I never believed really I could get, take the next step. But when I started playing, I realized that I could do better and, you know, I was jumping in the line outs because of my basketball skills. Mm -hmm. The game was different at that time, there was no lifting and things like that, so I was winning a lot of ball and then at the same time, then CH uh, had Sridharan and Junaidin at that time. I think both came out of mm -hmm. Royal and played for Sri Lanka, two huge guys. And uh, so they both retired and I was very fortunate. And then CH wanted me to come to Colombo and in Kandy, I didn't have a job anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was just playing rugby. And then one of my colleagues like Marlon Monnaht who played cricket for Sri Lanka and uh, he was working in Colombo and he was attached to the same company that, you know, was sponsoring CH and FC. Mm -hmm. so, they wanted me to come down, so I came down after the league and played in the knockout. Knockouts for CHNFC, actually. I was fortunate enough to win the Premadas Trophy at that time, the first tournament I played. And then the following year, I continued to play for CH, and then, then I switched clubs, actually. I mean, I, due to employment, I had to, you know, I had to change jobs, and then as a result, then I mm. ended up playing for CRNFC. And then after that, uh, in 1992, the, some of the players, I mean, we decided to, you know, for reasons known to all of you, and we went to Candy, and um, and that, that's what it, that was it. 
Yeah. Well, that, that actually seemed like a, a move that was just between the CRNFC factions at the time, but it was a move that really did volumes for Candy Rugby, isn't it, Priyanta? Because yeah. Candy Rugby was not on the map at that time, but now even all a lot of national players coming out of Candy, that move uh, played a huge dividends for Sri Lankan rugby. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look back, I mean, certainly, I mean, you had only one province playing A Division rugby, and then you had Candy, and then there was a time we had few clubs from Gaul as well as now all of it here, but we couldn't sustain. I mean, yeah. Candy. I mean, in fairness, because Malik, you know, you know, he's involved there, and then he's um, looking after that whole, you know, system. Uh, but Candy, Candy Rugby has really, you know, taken another step. I mean, there are lots of things that I can talk about, but um, yeah, a lot of talent come out of Candy. Unfortunately, they, they don't get captured there. So, you know, they come to other clubs and then sometimes they go back to Candy. But um, as you said, yes, uh, I mean, when, you, when I look back, uh, it has done a lot of good. I mean, we didn't look at it like that that, that time, you know. Mm -hmm. As uh, speaking about talent getting captured, Priyanka, there's loads of players coming through schools. There's more, almost 2,000 players that are playing the game at first 15 level. Uh, is there a case for more clubs actually for these players to play in or is there not enough uh, competition? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't want to open a can of worms, but the truth is, if you look at the national level, I mean, most of the speakers before would have also said, we have very limited resources at the national level. Mm -hmm. And in 15th rugby, I don't know how far we can go. Right? For 7th rugby, yes, the sky is the limit, right? Mm -hmm. I believe that we can get into the Olympics or we can probably win the win a medal at the Asian Games or may, at Commonwealth Games. So there is an opportunity. I mean, you see countries like Canada winning, you know, the gold medal, yeah, I mean, the championship, you know, yeah. the last Singapore yeah. Sevens and things like that. So there, there is an opportunity for Sri Lanka to move in that direction. So the 50, so from 15 aside, I don't know how far we can go. So with that in mind, then you look, if you look at it, now the schools rugby is, is the biggest thing in any sport, if you look at it, uh, mm -hmm. in Sri Lanka. But the, it's been run by very amateurish people. Mm -hmm. And if you don't develop the talent at that level, I mean, we are not going to be successful at the top level. Sure. So we certainly have the talent at the junior level. So is Sri Lankan rugby, that is Sri Lankan rugby union earlier, and schools will have to work together. So we have to find a mechanism between the sports ministry and the education ministry, which we are doing now, mm -hmm. to take not to take over, to work with in hand so that we can develop the sport at that level. I mean, you, you look at it, uh, you, you know the teachers, like, you know, they, they really struggle, right? Yeah. You know, and sure. their salaries are not the biggest. And so in some cases, like most of them survive on tuition, giving mm -hmm. tuition. Like the people who can't even give tuition sometimes get involved in the sport, okay. you know? I mean, I'm yeah. very controversial, I know that, but uh, that's the truth. And so the caliber of the people running the game. Caliber of the is, people, again. Yeah. So, so they have no vision, nothing, you know, there is no plan. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, they are reporting to the education ministry. So right. Sri Lankan rugby has no power, you know, to mm -hmm. go and take over and develop because we have the knowledge, we have everything. And they have the talent. So if we don't marry together, I mean, then you cannot develop. So we are working hard now and hopefully you'll see some, the, I mean, you know, results soon. Well, Sri Lanka rugby has wanted to have some kind of role, a development role, or organizational role with schools rugby for a while. There's been a bit of a divide about it. Uh, Priyanta, as CEO, can you tell us at what stage those negotiations are, if at all? Yeah, because um, when I came in, I mean, there was an, a sponsorship negotiation that mm -hmm. was discussed and then suddenly everything fell apart mm -hmm. because I think there's, there's lack of professionalism. But fortunately, I mean, uh, Sunil Hetiarachi, the, the, the Secretary for Education, he's working very closely. And also the sports minister is like really hands-on. I mean, okay. I must say that he gets involved in every meetings and, you know, so he, there's lots of good, good things happening. Mm -hmm. So if we can work together, I think it's the sky is the limit. Then you can have more clubs because then uh, Sri Lanka rugby will have to step in and identify talent maybe for the starters at 16 level, under 16, and then contract them and then start tours during that time, then have the academy. We are also working with the, you know, mm -hmm. with, with the New Zealand Rugby Union okay. and also with the sports ministry to get a place. So if that works, so because our Prime Minister has had uh, initial discussions with the New Zealand Prime Minister, so they are willing to give us the expertise. Ex yeah, ex uh, yeah. So then uh, what we need is so, to set it up. Mm -hmm. And then also we have to have a mechanism that we 
you know, continue with it, like, you know, not, you know, yeah. stop it, like, you know, like what, what happened previously, like mm -hmm. you had all these big tournaments, then suddenly they stop it, then they start another mm -hmm. one. There has to be continuity. So that's what we are working, you know, at the moment. Just uh, to tell you a bit about the development since you asked me, I think uh, if you just look at the history, like, you know, the, the worst thing that happened, happened to this country is the war. We had a 33-year war. The, as I see that the only good thing that came out of it is every major city has a army, navy, air force base. Mm -hmm. So what we are thinking is we use, use utilize those facilities and see how we can develop the game. Okay. We just brought in former general Dharat Nayaka okay. as the chairman of the development committee. So we see that out of the nine provinces you have 25 districts and there are about 98 educational zones. So we identify an educational zone mm -hmm. and then we work with the forces and so they have the infrastructure, the facilities. Sure. So identify 10 schools around that area and then we coach this, uh, you know, personnel from okay. the forces and send them because there is no cost. Right. I mean, of course, we'll have to give them an allowance or something like that. So then, then you can start developing. So that's the model we are going to, you know, start with initially and then okay. we can do it all sports because the facilities are there sure. anyway. Sure. So I hope that will work out and also, the school's uh, education ministry is employing 3,200 new uh, sports officers. So we have already discussed with them so that they will allow us to employ at least 10 through the education ministry as teachers who are rugby players. So okay. that way we can send them to schools as well. So we are having a very aggressive plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we are hoping that we can produce at least 30,000 new uh, rugby players within the next three years. So okay. that's the challenge. That's a fantastic plan and hopefully it will work out. You can count on the Papri.com support, of course, for okay. everything. But uh, tell us, Priyanthi, you played in an era before the game went fully professional. Yes. It was just about going professional when you hung up your boots. Uh, what's the change that you've noticed? I mean, I mean, at that time, if the rugby as a sport didn't go professional, I mean, we would have lost a lot of players because the league was getting bigger, rugby league, and they were paying players, and they were like, professional rugby being played in Italy and a little bit in France. So the rugby, the thinking was we will not be able to hang on to these players, mm -hmm. right, you know. And, uh, but I, if in fairness, I know, I mean, they, different people have different, you know, thoughts. But in my opinion is that did a lot of good. But I, I can proudly say I didn't play, you know, in the professional league. I didn't <laughs> charge for, you know, my Your services. Yeah, services. Yeah. But, uh, but having said that, I think street adapt it properly because what, what happened is like if you look at most of the successful players they played the game to the best of their ability and as a result they got paid mm -hmm. now Sri Lankan rugby players are playing for money mm -hmm. and that is that that mindset you know so the it's new the Zealand, yeah, before the horse exactly so the, the, you, in the news if you take a look at New Zealand model it works so well they pride in the jersey <laughs> now if number seven who's wearing the jersey um, I mean, he can be an average player or, you know, I mean, any All Black is above average. But I'm saying, if you look at the players who have played in the yesteryears, they, he must be like, you know, far below. Mm. Like you, you say, somebody has to fill in Richie McCall's, you know, position. Mm. So that guy steps up to that position, otherwise yeah. he would wear that. Yeah. He will say, I won't wear that because that's what was worn by Ricky Ma Richie McCall. So you it know? doesn't matter what you pay him. But he's yeah, not, yeah. He, he doesn't matter. So he, for the country, there is no money involved. Mm. But they make the money outside, like, you know. But then, then they negotiate and then, of course, they have their agents who negotiate and do all that. But the players are left alone to just to play the game. Mm. I think our players don't have that ability right. because they're trying to make a quick buck. As a result, they miss, miss out on a lot of other things. Mm. I think if you focus on the game, the money will come. Well, I, I do know the New Zealand Rugby Football Union takes a lot of trouble in educating their younger players. They teach them about investment and people who come into the super rugby system. They, they're given a lot of educational um, support, as it were, at that level. As CEO, Priyanta, do you think that uh, the SL Sri Lanka rugby could be doing a little bit more for the younger players who graduate from school and come into clubs at professional level? Yes, we, we could do that, but our, our problem is we are like the old England rugby union now, because clubs control the players. Right. We don't pay the players, mm -hmm. because as I told you, the value is in the schools, right? The, the, all the talent, you know, you, where else you will see a 
you know, person paying thousand rupees to go and watch a school match. Mm -hmm. You know, only in Sri Lanka. I mean, look at the average salary of twenty five thousand. People are paying thousand rupees to go and watch a match. Sure. And whereas in New Zealand, sometimes they don't go because the ticket prices are high and it's about twenty seven dollars. Oh. I mean, yeah. yeah. So average salary would be like you know thousand seven hundred dollars or whatever. So, so in Sri Lanka, the rugby is popular at that level. So that's where we need to go and you know change the mindset of the people and then you know get educate the players here so you have quality rugby played at that highest level right so so the i mean, I mean you go for a club game you hardly you see people mm. but we, we we are now getting some outside party to go and you know so really see what the problem is okay. whether it's the whether it's that it's a one horse race or whether it's because of this ticket the prices or ticket prices or it, it can or be the the way the game is being played, sure. the, phys the physical part of the game, or all that, you know. Like you see, New Zealand rugby has, you know, changed so much. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to watch, you know. Yeah. You know it's, so, it's, it, there, there, are, there are a lot of things that we need to look at, you know. You played in Otago, uh, Priyanta, you played a season in, uh, way back in the day. Uh, what is the philosophy that you bring back and that you can impart on current administration and players? Uh, because I, I went there as a player, so when I went there, I mean, I, I had no clue what was going on, and then I, I didn't realize how, I mean, how tough the season was. I mean, I can remember the very next day I went there, and then I was watching this game, and the and front they had a friendly game, and the mm -hmm. front row got up and they went at each other, you know, and then we had an All Black who was, who was the coach of the team. He was seated next to me. I said, I don't think I can survive A division. <laughs> can I play B division? He just punched me on the face, and it was so funny, and then he introduced me and said we have got Asia's best line out jumper and all that and I can remember the first uh, session we had scrum aging session and I did five scrums and started vomiting and you know I was thinking what the hell is going on it was <laughs> minus three right I was right. like so so it was funny that you know they once they contract you and they give you a chance I mean they give you a chance at least three four games mm -hmm. to play because you you would be in a, given a contract so I went in as a second row I was given mm -hmm. a contract First match I can remember playing because one when I went there, um, then I realized I had to do a bit more, you know, if more I work, want to get yeah. yeah more. So I trained in the morning, then I trained in the afternoon with the Samoan number eight, national number eight mm -hmm. was playing. So, and then in the evening I had practices or so I went to circuit training. So I just you know did lots of things during that period, like three weeks window. And my first match was against a side called Varsity A, and we lost uh, seventeen three. I didn't do anything good or I didn't do anything bad to get dropped. I got one of few line outs, I, you know, we took the ball forward and, you know, made a few tackles. So I was, I did enough to survive, you know. And when I came out of the game, the funny thing was then I realized they, this team had four All Blacks, current All Blacks, wow. right? And John Timu and all these Mike Brewers and all this right. current All Blacks and 13 of them were Otago players. And Otago beat the British Lions that year. Wow. So that changed the, you know, whole, you know, my stay changed. I mean, very next day I won the player of the day and I jumped against the All Black wow. and I won all the line out. So it's more psychological. That's why you see, if you watch New Zealand rugby, you watch a lot of rugby. The Super 15, you watch players and they are like, you know, pretty average. And then suddenly they wear the All Black jersey and they are they different. Move up, uh, different. They move level, up. Yeah. They, they, there's so much room for improvement. I think that's the, the psychological part. I think for me, what I learned from New Zealand is the self-belief. If you believe in yourself, I mean, sky is the limit. You know, you can do so much. I mean, they, they teach you, like, you know, I can remember first day, very first day, sitting with, like, you know, 25 rugby players and then some are Otago coaches, some, they have a couple of All Blacks who are in the, you know, team management and they all talk and first day you might say something stupid and then you listen to all these guys, then next day you're saying something. You learn so much. I mean, I can't even, you know tell you how much I learned. I mean, That's a pretty awesome experience. Yeah, is, it's, it's, is there a chance that perhaps some of our promising young players could get exchange programs, maybe in Japan? Or? We can, we can. I, I, th I think lots of things, are, that's, that's where I, uh, I tell these people, there are lots of things that we need to look at the big picture. I mean, we are concentrating on a lot uh, at the high performance. We have brought in Imti Marika, and I think Imti is doing a fantastic job. And then now we are, our focus is like, like you told, like I told you, it's a, that's the low end, that's mm. the bottom of the pyramid. But in the middle, we have lots of problems, like you know, how do you elevate the players from clubs to the national team, mm. and also from the schools? So there is a gap between the clubs and the because we don't have a provincial system, yeah. Yeah. and then you also have the schools and the club problem. So those two we need to you know 
some or other find a way because that's if you don't fix those two, having the you know high performance and the low, low, lower level, the, the development, it's not going to help us. Is uh, being a CEO a bigger challenge than anything you played on the field, Priyanka? I don't know. I, mean, so I, 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 re I really enjoy what I'm doing. Okay. I know. I mean, I had to work with the ministries and all that. You know, it's like, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's like watching paint drive when you get good. So it's, uh, but, but having said all that, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. I mean, I can't. The problems are there. I mean, if you don't have problems, I won't have a job, right? Sure. So, so it's, uh, but it's, it's fun. I mean, it's fun. I, I believe, I mean, when I leave this job, I can, you know, do something for Sri Lanka rugby. I mean, that's something I've been a president. I mean, Lots of people whom you have interviewed before have been presidents and involved in somewhat. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I mean, we have done our bit, but I don't really see we, any of us have done, you know, really work for it, for us to have a ground, have an office space, you know, have an academy. We don't have any of those things. Mm -hmm. And we talk about a history and, you know, what we have done. So if we can have those three by the time I leave office, I mean, I'll be happy. Fantastic, Priyanka. We really hope you manage to achieve those uh, count on our support. Uh, DFCC Know and Grow, you've heard from uh, Sri Lanka's former rugby captain, current CEO of Sri Lanka Rugby as well, Mr. Priyanka Ekanagi. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.